You have striking combos, triangle, poxal, takedowns, anti-grappling, ground fighting, knife fighting, chi sao, sparring, and street smart self-defense techniques. Fight commentary breakdowns, Rob and Dean, you guys have seen them on the channel. One of the guys who taught me Wing Chun back in the day, kind of wanted to bring in two different sorts of martial artists to watch with me and kind of react to some of the stuff because I've taken more lessons of different martial arts and then these two guys are more expert than I am. So I think we're gonna have a very good reaction. Student who is a novice or beginner learns a level one and it progresses through level one, two, three, four, even up to level five. It sounds like a lot, but it's a way for a student's brain to comprehend all these other different techniques, categorize them, make them very easy to process and to bring up like a card catalog in your memory. Level one striking combination that every student learns. So all they're gonna do is they're gonna come in here, they're gonna go. Our triangle level one, do you know throws a punch? I block it from here, I always step behind the block, step behind the block and throw a technique. One more time, he throws a punch, I block him. I wanted to give these two a little context before we react some more. So this guy was a division one football player. He got into Wing Chun, I believe in college. And after college, he just kind of went with it. And his Wing Chun is a little different because it's not an Ipmon branch of Wing Chun. And on top of that, because of his college football experience, he's all about explosiveness and all that. Very athletic. Yeah. I could tell he's athletic and he's very linear in his attack. And so I met this guy in 2014 when I came to LA briefly. One of the things I kept telling him, he has these two habits. One is he's a big guy and all the students are smaller than him. Mm. So he's always doing these techniques on a smaller student. So mm -hmm. I told him, in the future, can you get your students to do it on you? Because it's hard for us to believe anything you do if you're this big guy bulldozing smaller people. Right. Second thing is he likes to show off his Wing Chun hand speed so he doesn't do things really Clear. Yeah, clear. Yeah. And on top of that, it's a compliant opponent, and that's why he's doing it so fast. But you know, if you're real life, if he's not being compliant, would you be able to do all those strikes on him? I guess the more you drill it, the more it'll become instinctual. I wouldn't want to get peppered with all of those, mm -hmm. but my only criticism is that it's so linear that all you have to do is circle off and you're not in any danger. One thing, Dean, I noticed when I saw him do the upper body, lower body type of chain punching is do you think there's a lot of power behind any of those punches? Uh, it didn't look like he was really rotating his hips or his shoulders that much. It looked like most of the punching motion was coming from his arms, mm -hmm. which doesn't necessarily mean that there's not any power, but it's definitely not like powerful punches. Mm -hmm. Definitely wasn't turning his punches over. Yeah. I mean, Rob talked about earlier how Kaji Kembo and stuff, you get peppered, right? Get so peppered. maybe that's what he's just trying to do. Like if someone's attacking this Wing Chun student on the street, just pepper the guy until the guy doesn't want to fight anymore. It's a blitz. Mm -hmm. You know, it's supposed to overwhelm the opponent. That's why he's not doing any head movement whatsoever to, for defense because he's solely committed to going forward and attacking this opponent. Makes sense. Dean, in Muay Thai, I know probably one of the first things you teach your students once they learn the basic strikes is how to sidestep and how to pivot, right? Yeah. If you're doing that to someone who maybe even has an ounce of training, a person will pivot out of the way and hit them. Yeah, I mean, in Muay Thai, that's a good opportunity to go for a sweep where you like sidestep them, use their own momentum against them, and maybe kick out their legs or something. Another thing that I noticed is he's like not defending himself at all while he's moving forward he's not bringing his hands up his chin's not down and that's just so vulnerable like if i were being blitzed like that and i've been blitzed before if mm -hmm. i'm being blitzed like that and i just have a really tight guard and sidestep like he's so vulnerable for attack if i just like let out one wild hook and land it it can seriously hurt him mm. so the second move we saw was he was you know there's a lot of the kind of the block and hit in Wing Chun. I think mm. Kaji Kembo, you guys have a lot of similar stuff. Mm. And probably in Muay Thai, you guys do some stuff like that. Maybe not, not like specific blocks mm -hmm. like that. I've done some of that in like bo and other styles that I've trained, but not mm -hmm. like this block stuff. I see. There are some techniques in Muay Boran, more older style Muay Thai, where like if someone throws a hook, you can elbow their bicep, Ooh. which is like really nasty. Yeah. Muay Thai mm -hmm. is very beautiful. Um, one of my favorite things about it is that attack and defend happen together. Mm. Right? So like a punch that's thrown correctly has your hand up and your other shoulder up. When you kick, your shoulders are protecting sorry, your shoulders are protecting your face, your obviously hands up. Same with knees and elbows. You you always defend as you attack and that's what Muay Thai is like. So Yeah. We don't really have much of those like block and then do something off of that. It's really interesting hearing Dean talk about some of the more classic martial arts because ultimately they kind of all are Similar concepts, right? Like hearing Muay Boran, Boko Tohar, there's like blocks and hits at the same time. It's yes. like once it becomes sportified, like Muay Thai doesn't have as many block and right. hits. Of course, most people who've had a real full punch thrown at them know that 
a lot of times blocks don't work against someone that really wants to hit you. Mm -hmm. Now, my thought is if you're going to block and hit, can you like throw a hit at full force when you're blocking at the same time? Does the body work that way? Like if I'm spending a lot of energy blocking and I'm hitting, mm -hmm. am I able to throw this punch really hard? I mean, you got to make a distinction between blocking and defending. Right? Okay. If you're blocking like this, you're not going to throw a punch like... Yeah, but, but, but that's, when, that's, that's, when what, you, that's what he's doing. But when you do punch, mm -hmm. you do want to defend. Like, uh -huh. So one thing that a lot of my, a lot of students I've trained in the past will will throw their cross and drop their hand. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like that. <laughs> right? So what I say is, instead of dropping your hand, right, I'm not going to tell them, stop dropping your hand. I'm going to say, shoot your hand up. Mm -hmm. Get in the habit of shooting your hand up. Mm -hmm. So that is your muscle memory. Now, you do this every time. Mm -hmm. So that's not necessarily blocking. So, I mean, yeah, we throw full power punches when we defend, but mm -hmm. if you block like that, it just wouldn't make sense you yeah. know maybe applying what dean's telling me you could still do that blitz move but instead of like someone throws a hook you block and hit maybe just do what dean says you know you like go in and hit them yeah. while you protect yourself and then maybe you blitz with a chain punch or something like that another default category would be our pox out so from here our level one simply looks like this i come in and with that i'm slap blocking so i slap block and strike simultaneously slap block, trap one more time Slap, hot trap, and then go into a nice, easy chun choy. That pox owl is easy to learn, it's proactive, and very realistic. One thing I noticed is he's doing a good job trapping the opponent's left arm, but what about the guy's right arm? The guy was, the uke was just holding his right arm completely still. Right. So, do you guys have any techniques like that in Muay Thai? I mean, in the clinch. A lot will have one arm controlled, mm -hmm. um, but we we'll usually be on the on that side of the arm that we have. Mm -hmm. So the other arm isn't really an effective weapon. If I have you here, mm -hmm. right, and I'm on this side of your body, what can you really do? That's true. My ribs, yeah, exactly. Like right there. That. And, and, you know, punches to the ribs but from that close aren't really that effective. In Kaji Kembo, you guys have very similar punches to, like, a chain punch, right? Sequences um, that we would do when we would drill, but that was more so, like, that it was so ingrained in you. If somebody went for something, you would just respond almost like born like, esque style. My brother was really good at that. I would try and do something on my brother, and, and he would just immediately just, like, slap my hands out of the way and kick me right oh, in the groin. Cool. You know, wow. Like right in the nuts. So thanks, Hank. Um, <laughs> cup or no cup? Uh, cup. Okay, Thank good. God, yeah. There you go. In boxing, sometimes if an opponent gets stunned, the natural instinct is to turn away from the oh, strike. Oh, wait, yeah. yeah. But a trained fighter will try and face his opponent because he knows that's where he can defend. Yeah. Unfortunately, when you get hit really hard, a lot of the times you're not defending properly, so you're caught in this loop of trying to turn towards your opponent, but you're just getting barraged, mm. like pop, 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 pop on one side. It's like a no-win situation. When I saw him like hitting to the side of the face just continuously, I was like, oh, I recognize that simply only because like I remember thinking like, oh wait, I should turn, I should turn, mm. and not being able to. Mm. Hook their lead hand and then throw a hook over it, or just like trap their lead hand and throw a hook over that. And Wing Chun does that really well. Like they block the hand away and then keep control of the hand and then do like three strikes from there. I like that about this. Th that, that last clip I thought was, it mm -hmm. looked cool. So our level one would be a side mount. Again, with this, I keep my body to where I can trap a hip. Again, can he roll away and roll into me? I don't have a problem with that. I'm trapping him for a split second. As I trap him, one of my easiest techniques from here is a hammer hand. What this hammer hand does, I don't care if I hit with my hand or up into my arm from here, my ulna. As I come here, I go one, two, three, four, five, and, or I go one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And then from here, I post, I get into my side spot from here. From here, I wanna go ahead and get his neck from here, crank his neck, I can crank his neck up, or I can go into these. <laughs> Side shots into the head. I don't want to hit to the face. I'm actually going to hit into his neck to ear, jaw, temple. So one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five. As I get from here, he's now going to combat me with his shoulder. As he goes to his shoulder, I'm now going to rotate. I get into a single carotid or a windpipe. From here, choke him out. He's going to combat me again. I'm going to reach over, bring elbows back into the side of his head. Finish with a figure four. I then post on this, post here, come up into a single knee top mount. Not too high, not too low, enough where I can control him and control his hands, hammer hand into cycle punching, or I can go ahead and do a cross trap into an open, into a single hammer, into cycle punching. One thing that I think I want to bring up that Dean mentioned as we were watching that clip is, we're not saying David's school 
is a McDojo. We are not saying that, okay? There's a lot of stuff to pick from this that can work. That's the point of me bringing on these two people. That being said though, this segment I think is a little bit more worrisome for anyone that has done grappling. Yeah. And I'll just start it with, he's trying to do kind of a neon belly, mm -hmm. but it's a neon belly that's giving the ankle to be swept. It's a very, you can even tell when he's trying to throw the strikes, like Dean even reacted. It's like, it doesn't look like he's balanced. It doesn't look like right. he's throwing with power. <laughs> yeah. <He> so that. <laughs> yeah. this is gonna work on somebody who's not trained. Like if this yeah. is, if somebody who's never ever taken a jiu-jitsu lesson in their life, this could potentially like pin them and like get them in some serious danger. Anybody who's trained for a modicum of time will not be pinned by this neon belly. And this guy's a big guy, and I'm sure it's uncomfortable to be under, under that neon belly. One of the basic tenets of jiu-jitsu is like, you're looking for extended limbs. Anything that's away from the body is um, able to be attacked. And so when he has his knee on the belly and his other leg is extended, it's his foot is by the head. Right, yeah, right by the opponent's neck. That leg is just ripe for the picking. You can just you can latch on to it. You can you can rip that heel that that knee right out with the heel hook. You can do a lot of different things. You can sweep them. So anytime an arm or a leg or anything is extended from the body, it's able to be attacked. So you have to keep that in mind when you're grappling. You want to keep your stuff in tight. Keep your limbs in tight. Obviously, his wrestler's transition to side control was, it's good, it's powerful. If he goes up against a trained person, he's gonna get reverse triangle real fast only because his posture was back. He was leaning back, he was putting his weight on the guy's sternum, which is good for catch wrestling if you're grabbing the top of the head and you're cranking the neck, but he, he wasn't doing that, he was delivering strikes. Mm -hmm. And so what's gonna happen, I would say eight times out of 10, if somebody who's trained in jujitsu, they're gonna push you back, they're gonna wrap your head up in a triangle, either have a terrible neck crank or you're gonna get your arm snapped. Rob, I will add that when he's in that kind of catch wrestler judo position delivering strikes, those strikes can be easily just, you just put out a frame and you can block those strikes too, right? Right, so the way a lot of people get out of that is from the aforementioned triangle or arm bar or you can take your feet, the whole idea in jujitsu is if you're trying to escape, you want to try to line up your axis with their axis. You want to try and line up your head with their head. So on the bottom, is if he puts his feet towards his uh, the mounted individual's uh, feet and puts his head towards his head, it's easy for him to roll him over backwards, uh. even if it's a large man. As long as you guys are on the same axis, fairly easy to just go ahead and sweep somebody. It makes sense. And then when he transitioned into the mount, you mentioned right. that was quite a very yeah. not so good both of you mentioned yeah. i think he's doing this as a way of saying like this could work in a street fight against somebody who's not trained mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so yeah take that with a grain of salt yeah yeah, yeah yeah um like that uh those hammer fists like he threw, who's gonna eat five hammer fists in a right row? like you're gonna move you can't that's not practical but yeah. some of the stuff in that maintaining that side control position and securing the head like mm -hmm. like you said this is some legit stuff you know to do in the street if you get attacked yeah. mm -hmm. but this would not work in competition yeah. if there was a drunk guy at a bar who doesn't know how to train but has the drunk muscles maybe this would be okay to kind of restrain him it's on the technique. ground maybe yeah. what I would have liked to have seen like if he's not gonna submit the guy with that catch wrestling hold what he should do is go ahead and transition immediately to like mounted crucifix and go ahead and hit him from there, right? You're in a, you're in a far less dangerous position. Uh, you're not gonna get triangled, you're not gonna get arm barred or anything like that. Just hold him in mounted position and deliver your, your elbow strikes or your hammer fist from there. So the transition to mount at the very end is is okay for somebody who's not a practitioner of jujitsu, but somebody who's a practitioner of jujitsu is gonna put you in half guard immediately. Yeah. Or completely sweep you. Yeah, completely sweep you. Because his mount, one of the legs was up, one of the knees was in the yeah. air. Yeah. Obviously he understands knee on belly, so when you're gonna transition to mount, one of the easiest things for you to do is just go ahead and either put knee on belly and slide it over into full mount, mm -hmm. or from side control, you know, grab your own heel, put it over the, the, the hip area and slide it and in, go into full mount uh, mm -hmm. without risking getting your legs trapped in their legs. One thing Dean mentioned while we were watching is he mentioned something about a single carotid. You I'm getting to, one of my carotid right now. I'm not, I'm not closing out. Yeah, you have to close both to of them. get a blood choke, yeah. right? Yeah. So when, when he says single carotid, right. yeah, you can compress the single carotid, but that's not gonna- It's uncomfortable. Down. Somebody will probably submit if they're not familiar with being under that pressure. Yeah. They'll get scared and they'll, they'll submit out of fear. There is a Von Flew choke from side control right there, which he can do easily. 
all you have to do is you wrap your forearm behind the neck and you put your, sh your shoulder yeah, sure. directly into the carotid yeah. and you just squeeze um, oh, and cool. you can lean into it and you can get that Von Flute choke. But that's not what he was doing. Yeah, no. Exactly. And again, we're emphasizing that it seems like he's trying to teach this against untrained, kind of just drunk people attacking you. So that's why he's kind of teaching you these things. Like these are things to put pressure on the opponent to potentially make them not want to fight you. So, so again, you know what I would say like about this guy? If you want to learn how to defend yourself, then this is a good guy to go train with. Right? If, I would say to start with. If you want to go, if you want to learn how to do competitive fighting, this is not the gym for you. Yeah. Yeah. Like, some people that want to learn how to defend themselves and not spar. Yeah. Some people want to learn how to defend themselves and never actually care about fighting. In, in, or it's more like they want to learn how to defend themselves, but they don't need like a crazy cardio workout. Yeah. Which is what you're gonna get if you go do Muay Thai, or if or you go, or if you go do MMA, yeah. or if you go do wrestling. Everything you learn, if you go to like even like a mediocre place, is something that you can practically apply mm. in self defense or in the real in it not real in self defense or in a competitive fight situation. Mm -hmm. But like this stuff is only stuff that you could apply in self-defense. Yeah. Like you can't do this stuff in the ring in an MMA fight. Yeah, there's a big distinction between like strategic versus like very aggressive. Like a short burst aggression. Most street fights would probably be broken up 15 seconds in like this, right? Mm -hmm. There's just there's just some crazy aggression that happens. Somebody ends up on the ground, somebody pulls them off and the thing's broken up. I think most people are okay with surviving that, right? Like that's that's the ideal. But if you're looking to like be a really good fighter, then you have to think strategically. You can't just have like a short burst of aggression and then expect that to carry you through like a prolonged fight. With that being said, I will show you two a little bit more. This was something else I filmed with him. If you rely on kicks and strikes to stop a grappler, you will get beat. You have to use collapsing energy, your balance, and your arms. So we're right here, and I'm just coming into you. My head is moving too fast. If I know what I'm doing, I'm putting my head over to the side. I may even tuck my head. Striking is not going to stop me, so you use your arms. They're longer, they have more leverage, so now it looks like this. As he comes at me, now I stop him with my arms. I'm gonna go with a low line block, what we call Lan Sao, and an upper line block where we cross our center called Gan Sao. So if he comes at me, it looks like this. I lower my center of gravity, much like an athlete would, and as that person's bringing energy towards me, I'm now collapsing this. And as I do that, it's real hard for me to miss. And even if I misjudge him, even if he comes a little bit higher, I'm hitting an area that's this big area here. I'm bringing it to where I'm hitting anywhere from his diaphragm up to his temple. So once again, we'll do it a little bit lower. As I get that, you see how from here, it's hard for me to miss. You ever had somebody shoot a double leg takedown on you? I have. Yeah, that's not gonna work at all. What's going to work is going for a guillotine or cross facing them. Like once you can cross face them once they've got your leg and then you can go in for a crucifix or I can... learned some sick shit in Cambodia where they shoot on me and I kind of frame on yeah. their collarbone mm -hmm. with my forearm mm -hmm. and their head like this. Mm -hmm. You're sprawling. Yeah, he's no, sprawling. No, not sprawling. Oh, it's not mm -hmm. sprawling. Catch it. I mm -hmm. think I can find the video. I was just teaching this to you almost yeah, yeah, the same yeah. thing in the park there, Dad. What, yeah. that? What I just showed? Similar. Yeah. One of the very first MMA classes I ever took under Sean Loeffler was blocking a haymaker, wrapping up the arm, and getting the stress position yeah, with yeah, the yeah, arm, yeah. simultaneously getting this for knees. Mm. You wrap up their arm and almost would look like a wizard come in and you get the Kimura grip sort of thing on your on the neck. Mm -hmm. And then you can get them off balance and deliver knees to the face or take them down the ground. So something I'm seeing what Dean was showing us was, mm -hmm. besides a frame, it transitioned into a stress position. Yeah, yeah. But from what her was doing, it was just a, it was just a hit. So yeah, yeah. Like a hit, so right. it, it didn't have enough leverage to redirect the energy or prevent him. His assumption was that you'd hit the guy mm -hmm. and the guy's forward energy would be nullified. I think that's a very hard thing to time. Mm -hmm. I think that the framing that Dean showed us yeah. is a high percentage way to stop somebody mm -hmm. because you're not using your muscles and you're not using your timing. Yeah. Well, not, I mean, you're using timing, but not to the degree that this one. Yeah, exactly. Turns. What Dean's doing, it's not force to force. Right. It's like redirect force and then control them. Right. Rob and I did a knife defense video back in the day and I'm 
kind of looked at this a little with another friend, but I want to show you to this. If it's a knife, you always want to try to go into it because that's going to kick their aim away. Comes at me and I deflect. We come through, we double arm this. I bring my stomach back, make sure I get my face and torso away from the blade, stick, control the knife, and we go on from there. One of the great knife fighting scenes in movies is Born Identity. I think it's the second one where he's got a blade. What is the problem with a blade? If he's blade, what is he gonna slice your cheek? If you're ready to go out for dinner, a sliced cheek is bad. But if it's a life or death fight, you slicing my cheek, what the hell do I care? This is life or death. What you don't want in life is you don't want someone, so I don't care about something, you don't want puncture. The problem with knives is when people would teach knife techniques, it was a person who was swinging these exaggerated movements. It's not me blocking this <laughs> right here. This looks good? Exactly. It's that simple. Do it again, please. Ow. Ow. So what we do is we use two arms to create more of a blocking surface. Come low, please. I've got it blocked here using my ulna, which is a natural weapon. Throw a little bit higher. So with this, go low, go high. Either way, I've, I'm using this entire area. Now, if I do misjudge the knife, where am I going to get stabbed? Well, I get stabbed in my tricep, outer flank of my, my torso. This is going to hurt, but it's not life-threatening. And it's something that I can actually absorb and I'll worry about later. What I don't want to do is I don't want to get hit anywhere on my face, my neck, my center line, my belly, nothing. As he blocks, he needs to stick to my arm. If he doesn't, I'm simply going to retract my arm Guys who stab people that we've seen in, in prison, do you think they're knife fighters? No. I'm going to kill you, adrenaline's going to take over, and I'm going to jab you 20 times. So I'll block, and as I do this from here, as he retracts, I'm going to stick. As I stick, I'm going to then neutralize the situation. You have to stick to the arm that has the knife. As he has this knife and he's getting ready to attack me, I don't want to wait for that situation to arise for, for me now to try to block a knife attack where I still don't know where it's coming from. So this way I can go after the knife. And I'm simply going after it in the same way I'd block it, in this sort of double arm technique. One of the first things all three of us reacted at the same time, he said you don't never have he didn't say you never, but he says you don't have to worry about slicing or Your slashing face. as much as a puncture. But the thing is, that's dependent on where you're slashed, right? If you're <laughs> slashed here, oh, you you have problems. Any place where there's a blood vessel that's within reach, sure. you know, you slash there. You're I wouldn't be more concerned about either getting punctured or sliced. Like, yeah. I'm not trying to get touched by a knife. Right. I'm not going to block in a way that makes me susceptible to anything. Right. Anything. There were some stress positions that he was going into that I thought were interesting and that I thought could, you know, be explored. However, the whole philosophy leading up to it, I think all three of us were like, oh, no way. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I, we've talked about this briefly in the past, but it's like last case scenario, you can't walk away from the fight or run away from the fight and you absolutely are trapped in a corner and you have to fight somebody with a knife. I know likelihood is almost like 80% or 90% that I'm going to get cut at some place, somehow, some way. So best thing I can possibly do is try and isolate the blade, get it to the ground, do everything in my power to make sure he doesn't hand that blade off to his other hand. Yeah. Isolate that blade, get it to the ground, and then dogpile it and then find a way to hit and stun, grind your knee into his knuckles or whatever it may be for him to get, get that blade away from him. Whether that's breaking the wrist, breaking the elbow, or you know, eye gouging, whatever it may be. The likelihood of you escaping from a knife fight unscathed is like very tiny. Yeah, especially if you don't have a weapon on you. you it's bare hands against a knife. You better pray a lot. <laughs> yeah. And something that Dean said that I really want to emphasize too is he mentioned that, you know, when you do this this block, this Wing Chun block, you know, um, it's okay if you get stabbed in your back. And Dean's like, well, your lungs are there, so your lungs are punctured. Right. So that's something to keep in mind. Yes, you got ribs there, but there's also, you got what's called a rib cage. It's not like a solid shield, right? So <laughs> depending on where the blade enters, it'll puncture a lung. It could Easy. even get to your heart. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the best ways to kill somebody quietly yeah, is to I mean, go through the back of the lung. He's basically saying you're like, 
exposing parts that are okay to get stabbed in. Yeah. Which yeah. is definitely wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, definitely. for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like, 100%. Yeah, and, no, no. Um, There's Robin, no part that's okay yeah. to yeah. get stabbed. Rob and I have a Cali friend who can talk about this too, but you don't want to ever be like, okay, yeah, if you have to cut something, cut my tricep or cut whatever. Oh, yeah. You know, you, now you can't use your arms. Uh-oh, what do you do now? The stress position stuff's really cool, and I, like I think that. it's something we need to look at more, but mm -hmm. I don't think you should tell students, first of all, this thing will get you out of a night attack I think that's something very important and then the other thing is don't tell them there's certain places that could get cut you're, you're more safe to get cut there I think that's really bad to tell people I'm taking Kerr's side here you have to defend yourself so when you defend yourself there's probably parts that are better to be stabbed in than sure. like your chest or your stomach yeah you want to protect your heart from obviously but there's one thing that you have to focus on and that's the blade you have to focus on the blade and that blade is attached to that elbow, which is attached to that shoulder. Yeah. Right? So you have to isolate that That's arm and you have to figure out a way to make sure that your focus does not come off that arm. No matter, not about, whatever else the person does, doesn't matter. I actually have had a knife pulled on me once and then the dude had the knife in my face and socked me. Mm. And then that was that. I didn't fight him <laughs> because I'm not going to fight a dude with a knife. Mm -hmm. But um, if I had to fight a dude with a knife, mm -hmm. my method would be like teeps and round kicks and mm -hmm. leg kicks. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to get anywhere near the blade mm -hmm. because I, I have confidence in my range attacks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I would just want to hurt him with range range attacks. It's mm -hmm. funny. But I wouldn't want to get inside because mm -hmm. he's a knife. Mm -hmm. you know? I would be very concerned about wrapping an ankle and then having my femoral artery right there for him to stab. Mm. So that's why I would be very concerned about kicking, but I do understand kicking some a knife out of someone's hand is not the worst option. I know? kick a lot. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, 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 yeah. Just, <laughs> just keep kicking, and maybe you don't even kick the knife out of his hand, but you kick him far enough that you have an entry to run away. That's like what I'm that's thinking. what I'm like thinking. Deep, create space, keep mm -hmm. the range. And there. something I want to emphasize too, um, David, if you ever see this, it's awesome that people are thinking about knife defense. If you're gonna say something like mixed martial arts MMA, you should be talking about knife defense. You should think about like gun and stuff like. You should think about all that. So the criticism isn't that he's teaching knife defense. It's awesome that David was teaching knife defense. This was 2014, 2015. That's why I put the segment in back when I put the video up. Mm -hmm. I was like, at least it gives people stuff to think about. One of the safest things you can do is bridge the gap and you get a little bit closer. What you're doing is you're jamming him. We're keeping this concept of a two-on-one, which is a Wing Chun concept. But as I get here and I get closer, this is pretty much what we call standing grappling. But instead of me grappling him or choking, I'm gonna learn how to strike and overwhelm him in a standing grappling position. Parallel, linear, cross. Parallel step, linear step, cross step. And again, from here, complete safety, proximity, and again, easy for me to go near shoulder or cross shoulder. The last part when he does the, I believe it's called the cross step, mm -hmm. and then he's taking the guy down. One thing that both Rob and I notice immediately is he's given his back. Mm -hmm. So like any grappler will just take his back. Mm -hmm. The partner just steps to his left, they'll just take his back really easily. But that the way he had leverage on the shoulder and the tricep, mm -hmm. and how he kind of rolled him over his thigh, that's mm -hmm. like kind of reminded me of a Thai style throw. Mm -hmm. So he's he's going yeah, here, mm -hmm. and this right? Is here. Go here, he's yes. controlling so the shoulder. You would push him here and push him mm -hmm. here. Like but, that. but no, but this is pulling. Oh, yeah. oh so it's like, it is like an arm drag. Yeah, so this is so it's like yeah, this is so, pulling. So I'm, and I'm pulling, and like I guess this is this is where the right. leverage comes from. Right, right. Okay. right. So my question is, if this is really cinched up, right. and tight, mm -hmm. and like uh, even closer to mm -hmm. the bottom, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, he he's can, actually even a little bit farther. Oh, even like farther, like yeah. he can okay. prevent you from taking the back with this. Try, I think. Try and lock it down. Lock it down. Lock it down. Oh, I mean, like really get tight. Oh, okay. okay. You ready? Yeah. This elbow right here. Oh shoot! Oh wow! Yeah. So, so I don't okay. have. So it's I don't not have like you could just walk and take it. You need to do it. I mean, this right here. Go ahead, go ahead, lock it up. Okay. Lock it up. Ready? Uh, I have. I have no opposition. Like I can either. I can frame here. Yeah. I can lock him up here. Yeah. Oh wow! Or like I can just go straight downward. This is. This is not gonna. I mean, unless I go like this. Mm -hmm. but I'm not. I'm gonna get my arm free from this. Ready? Lock it yeah. up. Yeah. Lock it up tight. Oh wow! <laughs> let me let me just make sure we're seeing <laughs> it correctly. That was nothing. And I, oh yeah, you're right. He is like that. So so it's it's not like 
I'm interpreting or I am just going So he like could this. just pull his arm down. Yeah. 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 So I don't have much leverage here. I really don't have much leverage no, here. Not at all. In judo, when you have a trap like this, uh-huh. this is you have an underhook here. Oh. Right. So if I'm gonna throw you, I'm gonna have my leg yeah, in like between that. here. And mm-hmm. I'm gonna lift and twist yeah, simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. He should have had an underhook here. That's, that's why I like the second one. Oh. The second one he's going across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, that. the second one it's a it's an inside step. That's oh. why I feel like the second one was more practical. Uh-huh. I mean, again, if it's an untrained person or it's a striking match or whatever it is, mm-hmm. I feel like the first one probably could work. Yeah, yeah. But if it's somebody who's looking to take your back or looking to take your neck. Yeah, which he always right. is. Yeah, <laughs> then. Like, like if you're here, right? So if you're, like yeah. your neck is right here. Oh, shoot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Like go ahead and lock it in tight. <laughs> yeah. You know? Arm triangle? Yeah. You, 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 yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, if I want to bump this up. Oh, I'll yeah. Go for the arm I'm, triangle. Oh, yeah, I could totally. Yeah, you could totally yeah. do that. So, Ready? Lock yeah. it in. So, lock it in tight. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you Ready? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, done. That's why I feel like the second one was so snazzy, was because he was using his momentum. Yeah. You don't give the opponent the opportunity to counter you as much, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Now, we were playing around with that, but we gave ourselves a lot of time to discover the counters. Yeah. When I did Kung Fu when I was little, the inside step throw that Rob liked, that's a common thing you learn in Kung Fu, Mm -hmm. too. So it makes sense that he would know that, too, because, you know, that's like a proven thing. Most systems have throws similar to Mm -hmm. that. People sometimes laugh at it when they say, God, this guy's trying to compare stupid football to this classical martial art. Yeah, I am. I am doing that, and it's not stupid. The thing is, as a pathfinder, you have to bring in correlations with other things we see to help translate what this martial arts trying to do. People who train in Wing Chun, if you spend a lot of time on your heels and it's all about this perfect form and doing this, that's great. You're learning a classical martial art and you're trying to attain perfection in it. Well, you can do that, plus have the mindset of a linebacker, of being proactive, of Again, pulling the trigger, crossing that bridge, defeating people, and having that mentality of using my explosive technique and proactive nature to defeat someone. He's trying to make Wing Chun functional, right? He's yeah. trying to be like, I was a football player. I remember taking 300 pounders down. Right. How do I take Wing Chun and make it so I can do that with my students? And I love it. I yeah. love it. And all, sure. both Rob and Dean love that too. Yeah. The mindset is a good mindset. I think that you can get complacent uh, sometimes in jujitsu because you try to work on technique and forget that you need to have a certain level of aggression if it's going to be an actual confrontation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. There's a mindset of being an attacker or being on the offense. Um, if you're just constantly defensive, it can it can be detrimental to you. A big part of who wins a fight is who's more aggressive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A huge part of it. If this system is focusing on a teaching aggression, that's great. Yeah. Because you know, not a lot. Even Muay Thai is not really like that. Not a lot of martial arts specifically focus on just aggression. Yeah. I, mean, I know Kaj Kembo does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not really Wing Chun. So this is a nice modernization yeah. of the ancient technique. A lot of the techniques that even we looked at, there's criticisms to the fact that maybe he leaves himself open or something because he's going in blitzing so hard. Yeah. But I guess that's ultimately what he's trying to do. He's like, well, the thing is, most people, it's kind of changing now, but most people aren't trained. But it seems like more and more people are training martial arts now. But if you assume most people aren't trained, if you just overwhelm them with enough of that mentality of, oh, I'm going to take you down, I'm going to walk out of this without being too hurt, then you probably will win with some of these skills. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, there was a portion in this where he said that strikes aren't going to stop him from rushing in. Mm -hmm. And when he said that, he was advocating, like, sort of putting his head down to protect his chin, but he was also looking at the ground, oh. and that's a surefire way to get knocked out. Yeah, that's true. So I would highly recommend against that, mm-hmm. um, only because there's a lot of skilled strikers out here that will put you down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you're going up against somebody who's not trained, sure, chances are you can shoot a double leg and you're not going to get knocked out because there is some experience to his philosophy, and that is that once he clinches with somebody, you know, the fight goes to the ground or, or he has success because nobody's nobody's challenging him. But if he enters into a, a Muay Thai academy and he tries to to blitz somebody like that, I think he, his philosophy is going to change yeah. pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe a punch won't stop 
the blitz, mm-hmm. but like a knee. Well, <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh, hundred percent. Or 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 if I sidestep and kick his leg, he will fall. Mm-hmm. Use his energy against him and just mm-hmm. sidestep and, and trip him. Mm-hmm. Like it's the strikes can definitely counteract the blitz. Definitely something that I don't think I showed when I initially put the video up, but I want to give a lot of credit to this guy. They practice multi-person scenario, dynamic. Okay, how do you line them up? And mm. this he's been teaching this for a year. So mm. I remember as YouTube started getting popular, people started seeing people getting jumped. Mm-hmm. All these, even jujitsu school started being like, okay, how do you fight against multiple? He was thinking about that for mm. years because he used to be a bouncer, I think. So, you know, he's mm. been attacked by multiple people. So yeah. that's something I wish I could have shown, but the guy I filmed that day, they were doing multiple tacker drills. They didn't want to be on camera, so I couldn't show the footage. I feel like his linebacker experience would certainly come in handy with that because you are positioning yourself, you know, like you're lowering your center, center of gravity, trying to position yourself so that you can push people around yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And that's what you need to do if you're going to try and stack people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But obviously a, back, a boxing history would come in handy for that, I yeah. think, or Muay Thai history. Yeah, boxing, Muay Thai, some wrestling. Jiu-Jitsu against Jiu-Jitsu. multiple attackers is not going to be, not going to be good. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. You're screwed. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Yeah. Think of that. We're making this video just to discuss martial arts, man. I want to emphasize that. There's good stuff, there's bad stuff, there's okay stuff. It's not to say he's ineffective or we can kick his butt or he can kick our butt or we can kick Wing Chun butt or Wing Chun people. It's not about that. We're just trying to create dialogue in martial arts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what this channel's always been. Again, there are some masters and idiots that we featured on this channel who definitely, I think most people can be confident to say most people can kick their butt, but he's not one of them, right? First of all, he's like this big, and he's a big dude. <laughs> so I wouldn't mess with him. Props to him for being a trailblazer, you yeah. know what I mean? And, yeah. And yeah. trying to, to bring things together yeah. and incorporate yeah, 100%. it. So. And yeah. yeah, he's you know trying to modernize traditional martial arts and make them more practical for today's society. Yeah. Every martial art is evolving. Yeah. You know, combat or non-combat. And to take something like linebacker mentality and add it to Wing Chun, I think is I think is brilliant. I give mm-hmm. him a lot of props. And you know, I really think that he's on to something. Yeah. Just maybe focus more on the defense and a little bit yeah. more technique in the in the boxing in the hands and chin yeah and then when you're on the ground just consult a jiu-jitsu guy there's no shame in that in fact dude imagine two weeks you bring in you bring in some specialists some muay thai specialists you bring in some jiu-jitsu specialists his playbook is going to explode yeah yeah, there's he's on to something for sure like again and i want to emphasize this like this dude's legit like Mm -hmm. legit in the sense that he's teaching you stuff that you can use Mm -hmm. in the street situation Mm -hmm. and all he's got to do like i like we said consult with the jiu-jitsu guy for the ground stuff be open if you're going to be this kind of eclectic style that has a foundation in Wing Chun. Wing Chun doesn't have the ground that Jiu-Jitsu has. You need to bring that in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of potential here. I'm excited to see where he goes. Yeah, that. exactly. And I made this in 2014, 2015, so it's interesting to see potentially where he's at. So David, if you ever see this spin, let us know what you've been doing. Have you been training with Jiu-Jitsu guy? Have you been training with boxers? Like, I'm really curious what, what you've been doing all these years because I, I don't know where he is. I lost touch with him. One last thing I would say is I showed some of this to a jiu-jitsu guy once and the jiu-jitsu guy of course had a million criticisms so i literally told the jiu-jitsu guy i said dude I'll, i can bring him in and you could teach him i'm sure he'd be down but the jiu-jitsu guy was like i don't know man G, i feel like you should want me to fight him i'm like no that's not my point and that's again what we're trying to emphasize here none of us are trying to say oh we're better than him or we want to fight him it's just we're trying to mm-hmm. find what works and what doesn't work right that's what this channel was always about and if you go train with dean at santa monica striking like i'm sure if you bring in something really cool like you dean will listen to it and oh, test yeah. it right yeah, i'm always this, yeah. i'm always learning too man that's what, yeah. what frank shamrock taught me always be teaching Always be learning and always be competing. Yeah, exactly. And of course you guys know Rob. Rob and I are always looking at stuff and always learning new stuff. Always learning. Yeah. you got to have that student mentality constantly. Yeah. And that's what this channel always tries to do. Student mentality. Yeah. Jaber Coffee, man. By the way, guys. It was really guys, good. I had some hey. a moment ago. Rob's about to hit 4,000 subscribers on YouTube, what? right? What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, guys. Congrats. Both of them will be back soon, man. Yeah, sweet. This was Fight Commentary Breakdowns. Peace. <laughs> oh yeah. Fight commentary breakdowns. <laughs>